And I call on the Minister, Richard Lockhead. Presenting officer, it's been 994 days since the EU referendum, yet because Westminster, as we all know, and the UK government remain engulfed in chaos, we still don't have any clarity as to where Scotland and the UK will be in 15 days' time. And this happens to be Science Week, and I want to remind Parliament that our scientific and research excellence is going to be disproportionately harmed by Brexit. And I also want to outline the Scottish Government's latest understanding of what Brexit means for our further and higher education sectors more generally, and assure colleagues that we are doing all we can to ensure our colleges and universities will continue to thrive. Any visit to any institution, as I was reminded my visit to the University of Strathclyde yesterday and the University of the West of Scotland this morning, brings home the international character of our campuses. Some of the best brains in Europe choose to study and work in Scotland, and EU researchers are driving forward our science innovation. It is therefore utter madness that the UK government is willing to damage the success and the rich cultural vein that adds to so much to student and academic life and our economy in Scotland. And I want to say today to our EU staff and students directly, you are welcome here and valued members of our community here in Scotland, and we want you to remain. Presenting officer, there can be no good Brexit, and it is for so many people a deeply personal and emotive issue as well. At a recent event at the University of the Highlands and Islands, I met Florence, who is originally from Hamburg. She broke down in tears as she was asking me a question at the Q&A event I held because of Brexit. Florence is one of many who have chosen to come and live and work and build their lives here in Scotland. And nobody, absolutely nobody, should be made to be feel uh, this way. It's completely unacceptable. Uh, unacceptable in the UK government's botched handling of the entire Brexit process is to blame for that. The UK government stands threatens the continued success of our colleges and universities. It means a loss of talent, a loss of access to EU programmes, reducing opportunities for student mobility, research collaborations and funding, and a loss of reputation on the global stage. And this is made much worse by the UK government's draconian approach to immigration. For instance, the proposed £30,000 earning cap will prevent the majority of early career researchers coming to the UK. And the recent announcement of an exemption for PhD level jobs from its own migration cap is a welcome but small necessary first step the UK government have taken. But so much more needs to be done. And in a stunning display of just how little the UK government knows or cares about Scotland, its proposed temporary leave to remain scheme would fall short of covering students studying for a four-year degree in Scotland. And then for some UK spokespeople to suggest, as they did, that EU students would then have to apply for a visa for a further year to make it up to the four years at a cost of up to £840 is, of course, an absolute outrage and should be dropped immediately. I have already raised these issues with my UK counterpart, Chris Skidmore, and I'm today seeking a meeting with the Secretary of State for Scotland, if he's still on post, seeking his urgent intervention on this issue. Throughout my meetings with the UK government and other devolved administrations, I have emphasised Scotland's distinctive needs, including calling for the reintroduction of a post-study work visa and full participation in programmes like Erasmus+. The European Commission's recent emergency regulation on Erasmus, I might add, is a very welcome statement. That allows for current Erasmus students to complete their studies abroad regardless of the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, showing a degree of leadership sorely lacking from the UK government. But again, that is for current Erasmus students, and again, much more needs to be done. If there is no deal, Erasmus funding is in jeopardy for all students involved in worker study placements across Europe from the 29th of March onwards. In the next few weeks, I will again be meeting uh, Ms Skidmore, hopefully in London, uh, to raise that issue and other issues as well. Throughout the past months, I've consulted extensively with all the sectors. I convened a first ever joint sector Brexit summit last November to discuss the expected impact of Brexit. I want to build on that and have asked the Scottish Funding Council to host another similar summit in April, just next month. However, there are immediate challenges, as we all know, which need to be addressed as a matter of urgency. Depending on if and how the UK leaves the EU, UK citizens studying for full degrees in the EU may suddenly find themselves liable for international student fees, medical care and travel insurance. And our estimates suggest that hundreds of students from Scotland may be affected. 
facing untenable increases in costs. Many of these students, perhaps even the vast majority, may have to simply just come back to Scotland. Their studies cut short, no degree awarded, and of course their dreams in ruins. All because of a Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for. And with the damage compounded by the UK government's botched handling of the whole process. Now, the Scottish Government has been urgently working with the sector to prepare for students who may return to Scotland and to minimise any disruption to their studies. The Student Awards Agency for Scotland has provided clear information and guidance for students on their website, which will help guide them in transferring to a Scottish institution if that becomes necessary. And today I want to offer reassurance to those students. If you left Scotland to study in the EU, and Brexit means you are forced to give up your studies, we do guarantee to provide student support and tuition fees to eligible students so you can study here in Scotland. And that's a guarantee you can bank on in these uncertain times. Presenting officer, we're also taking action to consider longer term rights for Scottish citizens living in the EU to access further and higher education student support. This will ensure that eligible citizens residing in the EU the European Economic Area and Switzerland post-Brexit can still return to Scotland to take up study in the future and be able to access the same support that they are currently eligible for now. As for those EU students currently studying here or thinking of studying here, we have already committed, as members will know, to providing tuition fees for eligible EU students commencing their studies in academic year 2019-20 for the duration of their course. This guarantee remains in the event of a no-deal Brexit. We are also in active discussions with the sectors about how we might support students beyond that period. As well as talented EU citizens, our university research is successful in attracting funding from Horizon 2020, the EU's flagship competitive research and innovation funding programme. A country's attractiveness as a place to do research is fundamentally dependent on that country's access to international schemes. Since Horizon 2020 launched in 2014, over half a billion euros of funding in research and innovation has been secured by Scottish organisations. But we're already beginning to see worrying evidence of the damage we are facing. Catherine Hamans, renowned professor of astrophysics at the University of Edinburgh, is shifting the majority of her research activities to the University of Bonn. And Brexit, she has confirmed, is the reason behind her move. 90% of her research funding has been provided by the EU and Professor Hamans does not believe this funding will be replaced were she to remain in the, EU, in the UK. And latest figures show that the total share of UK and Scottish participations in Horizon 2020 projects is falling. Our researchers are telling us the EU partners who would have wished to collaborate are avoiding doing so with partners in the UK due to the ongoing uncertainty. The Scottish Government is seeking to provide much clarity or much needed clarity where we can and to represent fully the interest of staff and researchers in the negotiations with the UK government. To provide just one example at the moment, we have demanded that more information is urgently needed concerning the UK government review by the Turing Institute on UK alternatives to Horizon Europe. My officials and I, along with the Scottish Funding Council, are undertaking regular discussions with the sectors in Scotland about these and other issues. Uh, this includes liaising with staff and researchers on issues that affect them directly, and we want to understand these concerns and to support them moving forward in any way we can. And, of course, I have taken these concerns uh, directly to the European Commission where appropriate. Last December, I led a delegation representing Scotland's research interests to Brussels, where we highlighted our world-leading credentials and continued desire to work with European partners and benefit from European funding streams. Just this week, the Deputy First Minister myself met with the Chair and Chief Executive of UK Research and Innovation. If UKRI are going to play a role in plugging some of the gap left by Brexit in terms of research funding, then we need Scotland to benefit and devolution to matter. So, presenting officer, much of my time and that of my officials has now been taken up by uh, considering how best to respond to the challenges and threats of Brexit. Beyond these examples I've highlighted, there is much work being progressed across the Scottish Government, from resilience planning to external communications to meetings with stakeholders and the UK Government. And I'm pleased to confirm that today we have published our Brexit Action Plan, highlighting the broad scope of activity we're currently engaged in across my own portfolios. And I will be writing to each of our college and university principals to highlight this and to continue the dialogue we've established between ourselves and the sector on the impact of Brexit. So in closing, I want to emphasize that the Scottish Government will continue to do everything we can to protect Scotland's interests in a very challenging 
and uncertain context. We recognise and value the enormous contributions that EU citizens make to our universities, our colleges and our nation. And we will continue to make the case, of course, passionately for the benefits of EU membership. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we turn to questions. The first question from Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. And can I thank the Minister for uh, prior sight? And I think members in this chamber are very well aware that um, the Scottish Conservatives mm -hmm have expressed very considerable concerns about some of the challenges resulting from Brexit. Uh, and um, I will uh, put on record that I have some sympathy for uh, the comments within the statement uh, that the Minister has given. Notwithstanding that, and the ongo on ongoing uncertainty of the final Brexit outcome, there are some areas of responsibility which do lie with the Scottish Government, and it's on these areas, uh, Minister, if I may ask you two questions. Uh, firstly, University of Scotland has been very clear about its concerns uh, for the future fee status of EU students and we very much welcome the 2019-20 commitment that you made to that end. But I also note that the Minister says in his statement that the Scottish Government is looking at what might happen beyond that period. So could I ask the Minister to update the Chamber on when the Scottish Government will be able to confirm its policy choice about the fee status of EU students for courses beginning in academic year 2020 and beyond that? And secondly, assuming that Brexit means that the Scottish and EU students will no longer be treated as groups with reciprocal rights to equal treatment, is it the intention of the Scottish Government to commit to retaining the £90 million or so that it currently spends on EU students to put that back into the higher education sector? Because I think the very strong call that the Minister will know from University Scotland is that that commitment should be there. Minister. Uh, I thank Liz Smith and for the spirit in which she asks the questions. Uh, in terms of our first point uh, in relation to the status of EU students and the uh, guarantee we've given to pay the, their fees for academic year 1920, it is the case, as I said in my statement, that we are continuing to reflect on what the outcome may be from the current shambolic process in Westminster over what actually Scotland's status will be and the UK status within the European Union post the end of this month. Clearly, we have a number of issues to take into account. Firstly, we have the uh, issue of the disruption to our institutions. We have thousands and thousands of EU students studying at institutions in Scotland, and they play a vital role within our colleges and universities. Therefore, it would be very disruptive if suddenly they were to become international students. We, we wouldn't know the extent of that uh, in terms of how many would continue to come to study at our universities and colleges, but we do know there would be some element of disruption. So we have to take that into account. Secondly, if we were to pay the, EU fee, the fees for EU students, for the following academic year, as uh, we were being called to give clarity on at the moment, these students, as things stand, would not be able to work in Scotland because of their status. That, I hope we all agree, would be wholly unacceptable. And that's why we need powers over post-study work visas and other immigration powers, as I believe there's a cross-party consensus within this parliament for, so they can help us take the right decisions for EU students in the future, so they can make their contributions to Scottish society if they did choose to come and live in this country. So there's a number of factors we have to take into account, but the number one factor we need clarity on is the outcome of the votes this week in Westminster and get some um, sensible decisions taken out of the absolutely chaotic process in West, Westminster at the moment. And finally, the second point about the, the money that would potentially be saved if we were not paying EU fees, clearly that's something also we reflect upon. We're listening closely to the case being put by the, the further and higher education sectors. We'll listen closely to what they say, uh, but clearly, again, we need that clarity. Ian Gray to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, and thanks to the Minister for early sight of his statement. The Minister is, uh, of course, right to criticise the Tory government for the chaos and the threat of Brexit, and I also associate uh, these benches with his assurances to EU staff and students that they are valued uh, and welcome here uh, in Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government didn't create this uncertainty, that's for sure, uh, but um, Ms Smith is right that there are some areas in which the clarity required has to be provided uh, by them uh, and I fear that in response to her questions that clarity is not in fact being forthcoming so let me return to, to, to some of those points because they are the critical ones uh, for universities. Uh, uh, does the Minister understand that university prospectuses for 2020-21 are out now uh, and so potential EU students need to have some certainty around their fee status 
uh, uh, active discussion isn't really enough. They, they have to, uh, uh, at least some clarity could be given about that aspect of studying uh, in Scotland. So will the minister not simply give the guarantee that they need in University of Scotland are asking for about their tuition fee status? I take the point you made about other things being less clear, but in that at least clarity could be given. And the same applies, the same applies to the resources that currently are spent on uh, tuition fees for EU students. Those amount to around £90 million. What the university sector is simply asking for is a guarantee that if less than that is required for that purpose, whether it's all of it or some of it, that that resource will not be removed from the higher education sector. That seems to me to be an absolutely uh, a, a simple thing to ask the government to commit to, especially and this is my final point, because with FE and HE facing such uncertainty anyway, can the Minister explain to us why on earth the government thought this was a good year to cut college and university funding in the budget? Minister. In terms of Ian Gray's demand for clarity, can I just say uh, he should not be uh, asking this parliament or this government for clarity in what's happening in terms of Brexit. He should be asking the UK Conservative government for clarity, given the chaos that's happening this week alone in Westminster. And let's get clarity out of what's happening down there to enable us to take proper decisions here in Scotland for the future of further and higher education. And indeed, of course, he could ask his own party, his own party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, for some clarity in his position in Brexit at the same time. We are very well aware of the potential impact on EU students in Scotland if there is a departure from the EU without any deal. But we absolutely must focus, and this week of all weeks, we must focus on getting the right decision for EU students in Scotland, and that is our continued membership of the European Union. And failing that, a good deal, which enables these very good arrangements we have with other European countries to continue. But I can tell the, the member that we are in serious talks with the further and higher education sectors about all the various scenarios that may happen over the coming weeks and months and the potential impact that will have in further and higher education. We will take a decision that maintains our links with Europe and does the best for the future of Scotland students and our further and higher education uh, institutions. Thank you, Ross Greer, to be followed by Tavish Scott. I would like colleagues to thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement and the work that the government is doing to try and limit the damage of someone else's crisis. But can I ask in relation to Erasmus Plus specifically, as it stands, if Brexit is to go ahead, we will lose both our right to freedom of movement and the UK's membership of the Erasmus Plus programme. We could, in theory, participate as a third country. That's not the same thing as being a full member of Erasmus Plus. But this parliament has taken evidence from colleges and youth clubs in particular who've made the point that without freedom of movement, the administrative burden of trying to participate in the programme is simply too much. So can I ask what work the Scottish Government is doing to support those who benefit the most from participation in that programme, namely our college students and those involved through youth programmes. Minister. Uh, Ross Greer highlights the huge contribution that Erasmus makes to the, the experience of students in Scotland and indeed the experience of EU students who come to study for a short time in Scotland through Erasmus uh, also. We uh, have made the strongest representations to the UK government that uh, the UK and Scotland should continue to have full participation in the Erasmus Plus moving forward and we want to see the UK government adopting that position and then putting it into practice as soon as possible. That is not their position just now and we have a lack of commitment and therefore there is the real danger that if we leave Europe without a deal on the 29th of March that will jeopardise Scotland's participation. Our disproportionate benefits from Erasmus because more students from Scotland participate in Erasmus per head of population by far compared to the rest of the UK. So the impact of losing out on Erasmus is going to disproportionately harm Scotland and of course uh, damage the experience of EU students at the same time. The situation just now is that we leave without a deal then clearly uh, as I said that will jeopardise the participation of Scottish students. We do have a guarantee from the European Commission as I mentioned which is very much welcome that current students in Europe at the moment, as part of Erasmus, irrespective of whether there's no deal or a deal at the end of this month, we'll be able to continue to complete uh, their programme uh, within Europe. So that is welcome. But we do need the support of the UK government to put the funding guarantees in place and make sure we get full participation in Erasmus Plus moving forward. Tavis Scott to be followed by Claire Adams. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too have uh, sympathy for the Minister in the, in the context of the 
lack of clarity caused by what's currently going on, although I'm a bit puzzled to understand why then an action plan's been produced that can't have many actions in it because of the lack of, of clarity. Um, so perhaps I could ask the, a question the other way around. Um, Katrina Miller is a, a Shetlander studying at the European University Institute in uh, Florence, in other words, a Scot uh, traveling, overseas, uh, traveling into Europe for her uh, study. She's a postgraduate and just about to enter uh, a PhD uh, there. Uh, she doesn't know what uh, the situation will be with uh, her fees uh, from March. She doesn't even know if she's going to be able to continue to, uh, to, to um, undertake her PhD. Now, the government did uh, look at um, a statutory instrument that was produced in London. I wonder if the uh, minister would be in a position to update uh, Parliament uh, uh, on that and the kind of circumstances that Katrina finds herself in, where there is no certainty about her future study, no certainty about the fees that she's currently undertaking. And therefore, we potentially lose a Scot who will gain valuable international experience studying overseas, uh, who may have to come back to Scotland. Minister. Uh, well, just as Tavish Scott expresses sympathy for the position I find myself in as Scotland's uh, Foreign Higher Education Minister, let me say I express sympathy for the position that uh, Mr Scott's constituent Katrina Miller finds herself in, because many Scots have benefited from attending the European uh, Institute. Uh, is an issue that only just in the last week or two I have written to the UK government about, expressing deep concern by the impact on Scottish students' ability to participate in the European Institute from Brexit, and again asking for action to be taken that would allow our participation in the Institute to continue and those benefits uh, to continue to flow to, to Scotland uh, as well. In terms of the SI, we were uh, very unhappy with the approach taken to the statutory instrument uh, to enable the UK to withdraw from the European Institute, and we did write again back in a separate letter to the UK government for that, and I will happily update the member uh, as soon as I can on the outcome of that. Claire Adamson to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, last week I attended the celebration of EU researchers in this Parliament. Um, seven of our world-class universities demonstrating some of the work that they are doing and showing how important Horizon 2020 is to the attractiveness of Scotland for, as a research destination. We already have achieved a reputation producing world-class research, some of which I'm sure will be um, celebrated in the debate this afternoon. And we know that this has been strengthened by EU citizens working in Scotland and our membership of the European Union. What can the minister do to protect research collaboration across Europe? Mr. Uh, Claire Adamson highlights uh, such an important issue, not just in terms of the impact on researchers and students at Scottish institutions, but on the future of the Scottish economy. Uh, this morning I was at the University of the West of Scotland where I spoke to some students, uh, many of whom were international students and European students, uh, who are involved in a 15 million euro programme uh, looking at the impact of 5G involving a number of European countries. And that's a European programme with European research monies, which of course we will up be unable to take any advantage of in the future uh, if we leave the EU with no deal. Uh, and uh, we are in close discussions with UK RI, as I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks, in terms of Scotland's ability to get UK research funding uh, in the future, if that institution does try to fill the gap that's left by losing out in the European programmes. But of course, the importance of Horizon 2020, which once again, if we leave, will have a disproportionate impact in Scotland, because we do better at Horizon 2020 than any other part of the UK. Uh, the best way to protect that, of course, is to continue EU membership, or get a good deal that allows our full participation in Horizon 2020 to continue. And my final point in Horizon 2020 is that, of course, we do have a guarantee from the UK government that any contract signed, irrespective of what happens at the end of this month, will be honoured up to 2020. But I'm told that only covers parts of the Horizon 2020 and up to around 50 million euros a year worth of research funding is not included within that guarantee. So once again, we have a very unacceptable um, approach from the UK government that does not recognise the importance of Horizon 2020 to Scottish institutions and the Scottish economy. Brian Whittle to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think despite uh, uh, many points of contention in the Minister's statement, which uh, as Liz Smith has already indicated on, we have sympathy with and further to the, the Minister's, uh, welcoming the Minister's uh, uh, pledge there on Horizon 2020. I wonder if he would at least join me in supporting the pledge by the UK Government to underwrite payments for the university participating in Horizon 2020. Minister. Well, uh, as I've 
just said, uh, we have very limited guarantees over the future of Scotland's participation, UK participation horizon 2020, and it's simply not good enough what we have at the moment. Uh, we also have the situation where the UK Treasury are carrying out a value for money exercises uh, before they take further decisions on our future participation, even without a deal or with a deal moving forward. Uh, and that is something that Scotland should absolutely be involved in because we're the biggest beneficiary of Horizon 2020. And of course, it's enormously frustrating to the Scottish Government because we're getting very limited input to that or very limited information back from that value for money exercise. But we know in Scotland, Horizon 2020 research funding is enormously valuable to Scotland. The international collaboration and also the amazing initiatives that are taking place, the length and breadth of Scotland's colleges and universities and research institutions at the moment. We can't afford to lose that. So I urge all parties to urge this UK government to give us the guarantees we require. Julian Martin to be followed by James Kelly. In July last year, in a statement about the loss of Horizon 2020 funding, the UK government said this, and it's a direct quote, the government is working in partnership with UK Research and Innovation to develop a new international research and innovation strategy. The strategy will further set out the desire to build on the UK's long tradition of international collaborations in research and innovation across all fields and our openness to international talent. My question is this. There are just two weeks until exit day. Is the minister able to tell us if this UK strategy has now been made clear to him and the Scottish university sector, and if it has, what it means for the sector? Minister. Well, clearly we are very keen to make sure that Scotland uh, takes maximum advantage of any UK research and innovation funds. And of course, uh, members will have noticed there was an announcement uh, this week for the University of Edinburgh out of one of the funds. Uh, and that is welcome, but we have to remember there are existing funds. And what we're talking about here is European funding over and above those domestic UK funds, which have been worth half a billion euros to our institutions and research uh, community over the last few years alone. And it's that pot of money which is crucially important. And not just that, it's the international collaboration that's brought with it, which also um, helps boost Scotland's international reputation for research and innovation at the same time, which is an important part of this debate. It's the soft diplomacy you get through scientific collaboration and the benefits, not just the financial benefits. So uh, we have a lot more clarity we have to get from the UK government in terms of ensuring Scotland does not lose out, should, heaven forbid, there be an exit from the European Union at the end of this month. James Kelly to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the potential loss of EU workers in key sectors like health and social care, can I ask the Minister what has been done in higher and further education to identify where there might be any potential gaps and take action to fill those gaps so we don't have a, an absence of skills going forward? Minister. Um, I have to say that's an excellent question from James Kelly because it's one that's certainly at the forefront of my mind in terms of how we ensure that we have the uh, skills we require for the future of the Scottish economy, given that we do face a reduction, as we know, in terms of young people through demographic changes in this country. And if that were to be compounded by a reduction in EU workers coming to this country, uh, that would be highly damaging to Scotland's future prospects. Uh, and that's linked both to the Brexit debate, but also how we work with our universities and colleges. So to give a reassurance to James Kelly, I can just say this is near the top of the agenda. Um, it's also linked to how we fund going forward because we want to ensure that we uh, address any skills gaps that arise uh, through Brexit as well as other demographic changes. So we're speaking to the college and universities at the moment about that. The Scottish Funding Council are doing a great deal of work on that and also on skills alignment between all Scotland's agencies through the National Strategic Board. Uh, and that's very much at the uh, centre of our attentions at the moment. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I welcome the measures introduced in the statement by the Minister, uh, particularly uh, those assurances provided to the students and also EU nationals involved in the Erasmus Plus scheme. I know because I was an Erasmus Socrates uh, student. But uh, I'd be grateful if the Minister uh, could actually uh, invite uh, Mr Skidmore, when he meets him in a few weeks' time, to actually come to Scotland, speak to EU nationals, speak to institutions in Scotland, including the Jack Kane Centre in Edinburgh, uh, who actually hosted the, the, the Parliament's Culture, Tourism, Europe External Affairs Committee when we did the Erasmus Plus inquiry, which I'm sure the Minister will be very much aware of, because I'm sure if Mr Skidmore actually meets 
students and people from Scotland. That would actually encourage him to provide some more assurances, actually provide the assurances that are required uh, to actually keep the Erasmus Plus scheme. Yes. Uh, I know that Stuart McMillan has mentioned before how he benefited from the Erasmus scheme and uh, he's a perfect example of uh, where you can go in life through uh, enriching your experience through these such schemes. Um, I indeed undertook a Carnegie Trust scholarship when I was a student and travelled to, to Brussels uh, and Copenhagen as part of my research, my dissertation, and it fills me with horror to think that my children may not have the same advantages I had in terms of freedom of movement and the ability to take advantage of going to other countries in that way. However, in terms of Chris Skidmore, the minister, I th unfortunately, I think the members missed his opportunity. He was here just last week, and he visited some institutions in Glasgow. Uh, and he has said to me, of course, as indeed the Scottish Conservatives today have said, that he's very sympathetic to the arguments made in relation to both Erasmus and Horizon 2020 and other dimensions of the Brexit debate. But, of course, even he is reliant on the Home Office and the Treasury and, of course, the Prime Minister and all the chaos at the heart of the Conservative government to try and get some clarity and take the right decisions moving forward. And that's ultimately what we require to get the right uh, decisions for Scotland. Jamie Green to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Sir. Also, can I continue in the same constructive uh, tone and candour as my colleague uh, Liz Smith today? Um, the Minister, as indicated in the statement, uh, mentioned uh, uh, some of the announcements made in the spring statement yesterday, namely those around PhD level occupations being exempt from the tier two cap, but also uh, I could mention newly updated rules on the 180 day absences concerning researchers conducting uh, field work overseas who then apply uh, to settle in the UK. Um, will the uh, minister acknowledge and perhaps even welcome some of those shifts and a willingness to, to listen to the concerns from across this chamber, but also out with, and I have no doubt in the minister's uh, capabilities and being quite forthcoming with his views with the Minister on his next meeting in London. Minister. I think the changes announced uh, yesterday, as I said, are a, a small necessary step forward, which of course I welcome, but I think it's very, very important to convey to the Chamber this is a very small part of a much bigger picture. And if you take the £30,000 cap, for instance, in terms of the immigration policy from the UK Government, uh, as any institution will tell you, that will cover a small percentage of the researchers who come from other European countries to study or work in this country. And many earn far below 30,000. And it's not just them, it's their spouses as well. They may come with a spouse who's in a lower wage than them. And of course, then they would not be able to get into the country without um, some difficulty as well. And then of course, the issue over the fact that uh, the temporary uh, a right to remain in terms of for three years and not four years to address the needs of the Scottish degree is another thing that has to absolutely urgently be addressed. So if these issues are addressed, of course I will welcome them, but we've got a long way to go before severe damage is inflicted on uh, Scottish further and higher education from the UK Government's immigration policy. And Willie Coffey. Could the Minister just clarify the action that the Scottish Government has taken and may take to support Scottish students? who might be unable to complete their studies at an EU university. You mentioned uh, fees in medical care in particular earlier on. Might, might they still be able to actually complete their studies at those EU universities if we can possibly bring that about? Minister. Well, again, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of this week's votes in Westminster uh, over, over the next few weeks up to the, uh, in the run up to the end of the month. Um, but clearly, if there's no deal, then EU students, or Scottish students, I should clarify, in the EU at the moment, who are full-time undergraduate students, uh, will then become international students and will potentially lose their rights. Uh, for, therefore, uh, that could have devastating consequences. Uh, and if there's no deal, then there's a whole range of costs that uh, could be incurred uh, making it completely untenable and unaffordable for Scottish undergraduate students, currently EU institutions, to continue their studies. That's why we're keen today to emphasise the assurance to them that if they do require, in very horrific circumstances, to have to come back to Scotland to continue their studies here, they will be entitled to all the necessary support that Scottish students get, and we'll make sure that's made available to them. Thank you and apologies to Jenny Mara and Tom Arthur, but that runs us out of time for our statement on the update of the impact on Brexit on further and higher education. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 16312 in the name of Ivan McKee 
on building on Scotland's strengths in technology and engineering to become Europe's largest space nation. And I would invite all members who wish to participate in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible.